All right, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Andrew, and uh, good morning, church. Um, I'll share a little word with you today. It's part of a series that God has really impressed me to move upon, and um, it, it won't be finished today, but it's not meant to be. It's meant to be part of the continuing series on, on prayer. Um, not entirely sure why the Lord leads in some areas of our lives, you know, as a preacher or pastor is, you have to depend on the Lord to give you a word. Um, because handling the word is a serious business. Um, you know, the, uh, you can, you, because you, if, if you don't handle the word properly, you can condemn the people who listen either to, uh, um, to the graves of hell or to the tributes of heaven so we have to handle the word properly and so it requires that you know before we come before the lord before we come before you we have to spend time before the lord you know and god has to lead us in a path that will be required for the people the word for the people and thank you very much for pastor for allowing me to speak in this holy place and uh, i i do take it very seriously uh, pastor for the word and the opportunity to speak to the people and uh, thank you very much for, for being a wonderful pastor to us. Now, this morning, I'm going to speak briefly on the subject prayer that moves mountains. Prayer that moves mountains. So bow your heads with me and let us pray. Our Father, again, we thank you that there is a word that you want to speak to your people through a manservant and we only ask that you would hide the servant behind the cross and let Jesus be seen. That the word that we speak would be your word, not our words. And that uh, the enemy may be bound and only the spirit of God will be here and the angels will surround this place for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, for some reason, I'm impressed uh, to deal over these last few messages that God has given me the opportunity to present, to deal on the subject of prayer different types of prayer. And you may remember that um, a few weeks ago, uh, I think maybe about four weeks or five weeks ago, I spoke on the subject, let my people pray, quoting First Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will um, forgive their sins and heal their land. So God calls on the people to pray. And uh, about two weeks ago, I spoke on the, the secret power hidden in the prayer of Jabez. What it is about Jabez's prayer that God recognized and honored. And we spoke about Jabez and his history. And, uh, and today I want to speak on prayer that moves mountains. Mark chapter 11, verse 23, if you have your Bible, and I'll invite you to, to, to look at your Bible. In Mark chapter 11, and verse 23, Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He had just done a big miracle. And, and he, he said to them in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, and be, remo be removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, shall have whatsoever he saith. So, so Jesus says, if we, if, we, if we pray, believing in faith, the type of faith and the type of prayer that moves mountains, then the mountains will obey. Now, we have to bear in mind that when Jesus was speaking, when we look at the exegesis of a term, exegesis means to draw out, um, you know, like how you draw water out of a, out of a, of a pool or out of a pond. When you exegete, you try to find out what was the meaning that God intended. Now, this, of course, was a figurative expression that was used in the days of, um, used in the days of Jesus. We have lots of figurative ex expressions. Jesus wasn't talking about a literal mountain. Some people get very upset. Well, how am I going to move this mountain in front of me, which is a literal mountain? He, he wasn't dealing with that. Uh, he was talking about the symbolic mountain of problems, mountain of circumstances, challenges in your life. Sometimes we even use the expression that if you focus on something, the molehill becomes 
a mountain. No, it's not a literal mountain it becomes. It just becomes a big problem, uh, an obstacle in your way. And so Jesus is using that same thing. And he said, look, if you have big problems, obstacles in your way that are so large that you can't get over them, you can't get around them, you can't get under them. If you pray the right way, then your prayer can move a mountain. So there is something about prayer that we need to understand that is different to the prayer that we sometimes pray. And, uh, and I believe that uh, certainly for the time that we're living in our church, each of us individually, and us as a church, we need to go to a different level of prayer in our lives. We just need to move to a different level because the game is up. Uh, Satan has enhanced the game. So Jesus was speaking in Luke 11, verse 1. You're going to need your Bible today because I believe it's going to be more of a study than a sermon. So go to Luke 11, verse 1, and, uh, and you'll see there Jesus was speaking about prayer. In Luke 11, verse 1, it says, It came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. So in, in, in the word here, in Luke 11, verse 1, it says, It came to pass while he was praying in this particular place, um, his disciples saw him. It says he was praying in a certain place when he ceased. One of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So the, the, the first thing to say is that, is that Jesus prayed. And, and he didn't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray. So prayer, therefore, has become something that is essential to the Christian journey. It's when you pray. It's not if you pray. And then the Lord gives uh, the, the so-called model prayer, which if you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it says the same thing. In this manner, therefore, pray our Father which art in heaven. So there, there are these two places where the Lord speaks about the so-called model prayer. Now, a couple of things I want to make very quickly with regard to the model prayer. The model prayer that is sometimes referred to as the Lord's prayer is not a prayer that Jesus could pray. You all know that, right? The Lord's prayer is not a prayer that Jesus would pray. Now, that's a prayer he sent for us. Now you say, well, why would you say that? Because in it says, forgive us of all sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Now, Jesus never sinned. So he couldn't pray that prayer. So what he set for us as an example of prayer. Uh, it's not a prayer that was meant to be repeated in, in, in a mantra fashion. Because Jesus says that the, he says the pagans are like that. He says they, they, re, they repeat words as prayers. He says you can't be like that. But what he does set up for us is a pattern of prayer. He says there are certain things that come out in, in your prayer life that this, this prayer will highlight for you. And so we certainly won't do it today because of time, but we will do it as, as uh, Pastor and myself work and I get a few more sessions to declare the word. We would work through things like the necessity of prayer. Today, I will talk a little bit about the purpose of prayer, the person of prayer, the privilege of prayer. These are all things that are hidden in that, in that scripture. But today, we will just look a little bit at the necessity of prayer or in the context of the purpose of prayer. Now, number one, one of the things that we deal with when we're looking at prayer is that, is that prayer should be taken seriously. Prayer needs to be taken seriously. And the reason for that is that we are in a war. We are in a war, and this war or this battle, the one that we're in a war against wants to kill you. You know, the Bible says the thief cometh not but to what? To steal and to kill and to destroy. The person who is our enemy wants to kill you and destroy you. And therefore, we need to take this thing seriously. Um, if you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it says, for we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual hosts in high places. We are in a real battle for our lives. Therefore, we need to take prayer seriously. And by the way, it doesn't say that that um, that the people who are wrestling against flesh and uh, not wrestling against flesh and blood and principalities and powers, it didn't just say it's only the pastor, it's only the elders or these spiritual people in church who are wrestling against this enemy. This enemy is attacking everyone, and the Bible calls them principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual hosts 
of wickedness in high places, which means to say we are in a spiritual warfare. Paul himself says that the, the, um, the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, we are not fighting each other. I don't need to take a gun or a sword or a knife to try and deal with the enemy in front of us. The enemy we are dealing with is a spiritual force, is a spiritual foe, and he is powerful, and he is mighty, and he operates in the darkness. He operates in secret. But this thing is life and death. You see, we have sometimes not picked up. We are very. We can sometimes think we're in a casual environment. This is life and death. This is war. And there will be, there will be winners and losers, victors and victims. And unless we take this seriously, we are always going to be defeated by the enemy. Now, if you look at it, the spiritual warfare that we are in, the Bible tells us that there are principalities and powers involved. Now, just to give you some idea of what we're talking about, go to the book of Daniel with me. Go to the book of Daniel, because Paul describes a principality and a power. Now, uh, a principality... Uh, refers to a geographical region over which a prince rules over. So in the spiritual realm, there are principalities that rule over geographical areas. Now, if you go to the book of, go to the book of Daniel with me, Daniel chapter 10, uh, you, we are introduced into Daniel praying. Daniel chapter 10 from verse 1. Daniel is praying. So we know the context is prayer. And in the third year, verse one of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the thing that was revealed unto me, whose name was called Belshazzar, that's Daniel, the thing was true, the appointed time, he understood the thing and the vision. And then in those days, Daniel, he says, I was mourning there for how long? Three full weeks. He was praying for three weeks. He says, I ate no pleasant bread. You know, though he was fasting. Neither came flesh meat or wine in my mouth, neither he didn't anoint himself with perfume for three whole weeks till it was fulfilled. So he was praying for three weeks and fasting in three weeks because of some problems, some issues of the vision that he wanted to understand. If you go to Daniel 10 now and you flip to verse 12, the angel comes to him, who is angel Gabriel, and we're going to discuss how the issue of these principalities come in. And he says in verse 12, then he said unto me, do not be afraid, Daniel. From, from the what? First day that did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God. Thy words were heard, and I am come forth for thy words. But look what it says in verse 13. But what? The prince of the kingdom of Persia, which stood me these 20 and one days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief priests, princes, came to help me and remained there with the king of Persia. So he said, from the first day that you started to pray and to humble yourself, he says, your prayer was heard. He says, but I've come to, to, to you 21 days later because I had to deal with a principality, a prince that controls a region. So there are spiritual forces called principalities, princes that control regions. In this case, it was a prince controlling the, the region of the king of Persia. And he said that principality was resisting me for 21 days. And the only way he could gain the victory and can come and declare the word unto Daniel, he says, I had been left alone until Michael came. Who was Michael? Well, the Bible says Michael is the archangel. Now, arch is the archangels means chief of angels. Doesn't mean he's an angel himself. And we know if we had more time, Michael, the archangel, is Jesus himself. Jesus Christ, the chief or commander in chief of the angels. But here it was that Gabriel was fighting a principality. He was fighting a prince over the region of the king of Persia. And he was resisting him in the spiritual realm. And Michael had to come to help him. Uh, he was dispatched, the Bible says, from the first day that you prayed. So from the first day, the war was continuing. And 21 days continued on until the archangel Michael had to come and help him. We are dealing with principalities that wrestle against us in the spiritual realm. If you go to Daniel chapter 10, verse 20, it talks about another one. Look at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 20. It says, then said, he, how, uh, then said he, know us now from whence I come unto thee, and now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, the prince of Grisha shall come. 
So he's saying, I'm fighting with the principalities controlling the Prince of Persia. After the Prince of Persia comes, gone, and Greece comes, I've got to fight with them too. So we're dealing with principalities. He's dealing with powers, spiritual powers, that fight against us in this great battle. And the only thing that can help us are the angels that excel in strength and the mighty power of Jesus himself. The important and interesting thing um, on this concept when he was talking to, um, to, to Daniel, he says, but you know what? He says, you have a friend called Michael. He says, Michael, your prince. Would you say amen? He says, Michael, your prince came and helped me. And I want to encourage us this morning, beloved, that we all have angels that help us. The Bible says God has sent angels that excel in strength that do his bidding. But we also have Michael, our prince. The Bible calls him the prince of peace. The Bible says he is Jesus, the Messiah, and he fights for us in this spiritual battle. So the message for us is that we are in a real battle and we are up against real spiritual forces in high places. Some are called principalities. They operate in areas. So you might find as you minister, you might say I'm ministering in, a, in, in, the, in the Reedy Creek area, but you go to minister in Robina and you find a different spirit there because they might have a principality operating in, in, in that world. Or you go to, to Brisbane, you find another principality operating there. There are princes who resist the word of God as we proclaim them, and we have to come against them by the power of Jesus. Would you say amen? But they are also not only principalities. If you read the word, it says they are also territorial spirits and strongholds. I don't want to go into spiritual warfare, but I need to give you some idea of what you're dealing with, what we're dealing with. So they're territorial spirits, that they, they operate in territories. And, and, and as you try to engage those areas, you find resistance against the work of God. They are familial spirits. Everybody knows what a familial spirit is? The Bible speaks of familial spirits. Anybody knows what a familial spirit is? Talk to me, if you can. Yes, it's a demon spirit operating in families. So it's a familial spirit. It operates in families. And so you have this, gener what people sometimes call a generational curse. So you have this, these demon spirits that operate in families, and you, you, you seem to have the same challenges with sin, the same challenges with iniquity running through an entire family. Those are familial spirits. Point we're making, brothers and sisters, we, and, and they have strongholds. That's the danger here. These demon spirits can set up strongholds in your life. They can set up points where they can capture you and they can cause you to fall, even related to your family. And so we have to pray. But we have to pray to come against these demon spirits because the Bible tells us that they are coming against us to kill us, to steal from us the kingdom of God, and to destroy us. So take this thing seriously. This is a real war. Even though you can't see these spiritual beings, they are there. And they are there to come in regions of uh, principalities, areas where you live. They come, to, they come in regions where you work. And they can even come in your family as familial spirits to work against you to cause you to, to lose the battle. These are real battles. These are real wars. Take this thing seriously. If Jesus took it seriously, then certainly we should because the Bible says, when you pray, say. It says we must pray. And there's a reason that we have to link it and I'll share May not share it you today. I'll just do one more thing and then probably close. And next time God gives me a time, I'll, I'll extend some of the issues for you. So number one, take it seriously. Number two, when you're dealing with the purpose of prayer, don't be burdened down by that which you're praying for. So on one hand, take it seriously. But on the other hand, don't be burdened by the prayer that you, the, the things that you are praying for. Because, you know, sometimes we get really burdened about the things that, in our lives. You know, we get burdened about our situation with our family. Sometimes we get burdened about the situation in church. You know, that's a big burden for pastor and, and us as leaders. We get burdened about the situation in the country and the, and the election and who's going to win and who's going to lose and what they're going to do. We get burdened about what's happening in the world and Ukraine and are they going to throw a nuclear bomb and blow the whole world up and so on. You know, we get burdened about our finances. We get burdened about our family. These are things that we, get, we can get burdened with. But God did not create prayer for a means of burden. God created prayer so we can take our burdens and put them on Jesus. Would you say amen? The Bible says, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So we need to give the burden to Jesus and let him deal with it. Don't be anxious about them. Don't get worried about them. We just need to pass them over to Jesus. Now, in Philippians 4 verse 6, the Apostle Paul says, be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto the Lord. So the Bible says, don't be anxious, pray. Don't be anxious about anything, pray. So the, message, the, the point is, anxiety is the opposite of prayer. Let me say that again. Anxiety is the opposite of prayer because don't be anxious, but pray. That's what Paul says. So if we're anxious and you're stressed and you're fearful and you're worried in your life, you're not praying enough. Because prayer takes care of anxiety. In 1 Peter 5 verse 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Now the word cast means to put the responsibility of something onto someone else, into someone else's hands. That's what the word cast. You take the responsibility of something and you hand it to someone else. You give that person the responsibility and then you don't have to worry about it because it's no longer your responsibility. Now that happens in business, it happens in churches. If there's something that's there and needs to be done and you have an employee, you hand it over to the employee who is a faithful steward. You don't have to worry about it. He's competent to do the job. You hand him the problem and you, you don't worry about it because you know that job is done. It's in the hands of someone else. Would you say amen? The Bible says that we ought not to worry about the burdens and be anxious about the things that are in front of us. We need to put those things into the hands of God and leave it with him. Now, Please don't understand that doesn't mean we shouldn't be praying about it all the time. The Bible doesn't say that at all. All it suggests is that when you put something in the hands of God, when you walk out of your prayer closet, you shouldn't walk out with that burden on you. You're very quiet. I don't like when nobody tells me amen. I need an amen here. It means that you agree. You, you, if you're walking out and you still have the burden, you really didn't pray. You just griped about it. But if you prayed and you hand the burden to Jesus, then you leave the burden with him as one who can take care of every problem. Because we are not designed to carry burdens. We get, we get all sorts of medical problems when we carry burdens and anxieties and worries and so on. Stress has been shown to be very harmful to the human body. So our bodies were not designed to carry stress and to carry burdens and to carry anxiety. And that's why the Bible says, cast all your cares about him. Now, bear that in mind. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be praying all the time. The Bible says you should pray without ceasing. Daniel prayed for 21 days without ceasing, but he didn't carry the burden. Did not carry the burden. We have to give the burden to the Lord. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. God wants us to cast our burdens upon him because he can deal with the problems and he can move uh, and, and deals with principalities and powers. Now, I want to share with you because we spoke about principalities and powers and, uh, and sometimes after I deal on this word, people get a little anxious. I'm dealing with all these demon spirits, and they are here. And these princes in, in high places and these hosts, you get a little worried about principalities and powers and how they're going to come against you. In the book of Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I want to give you a word that might encourage you. For those who know we are fighting against these powers, they are real demon spirits, as Paul says, and they will come against us in the secret and silent place. It's a hidden enemy. It's a guerrilla. You see, these, these demons are, are, are fighting a guerrilla warfare. They, they, they strike when you don't see them and they attack you when you don't know where they're coming from. But we need not be worried. For in uh, Colossians 2 9 and says, says, For in him, meaning Christ Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, verse 10, and you are complete in him who is the head of what? All principalities and powers. You see, Jesus is in charge of the principalities and powers. He says, these guys who are coming against you, you don't need to be worried because he says he is in charge of them. He can, he can take care of them. That's why when, when, uh, when, when Gabriel was struggling with the principality in the days of Daniel, he called for Michael, the prince, and he dealt with the principalities and powers. So we need to take prayer seriously, but we don't need to get worried. We don't need to, get, to be stressed about our situation because Jesus is Lord. Would you say amen? He is in charge. He taught us how to pray. He taught us these words. And, and over the next few weeks, as, as time permits, I'll go through uh, the aspects of prayer. 
So if you're carrying a burden today, I'm going to close on this, this word uh, because I said I wouldn't take too long. If you're carrying a burden right now, you need to lay your burden at the feet of Jesus and leave it there. Would you say amen? You see, some of us lay our burdens at the feet of Jesus. Well, they may be better illustrated. So here you have your burdens and there's Jesus. And so, well, we're leaving our burdens at the feet of Jesus. And so you, you place your burden and you rest it at the Rest it at the feet of Jesus. Say, Jesus, you see, I've, I, I, I put my burden right there at your feet. It, it, it's right there, Jesus. And, and I know you can deal with the problem, and I'm going to leave it right, right there. It's like, Jesus, just look down. It's, it's right there. It's right there at your feet. Yeah, and you can see it, and I'm just leaving it for you. Okay, if you're not doing anything about it, I'll take it. And that's what we do. We leave it there, and because we, we, we take it back up. You know? You know, I, I, you know I, I, sometimes we hear people come and, you know, they're so burdened with all their problems. And you say, look, brother, did you, did you, did you, um, did you leave this burden with Jesus? Yeah, I've left it many times. I've left it many times. <laughs> so you really didn't leave it. You, you, you leave, we're leaving it and picking it back up. We're, we're supposed to cast our cares upon him. Leave our burdens at the feet of Jesus. Don't pick it back up because you don't think he's, he's twinkling toes with it. Leave it. When he's ready to move upon it, he will. So he taught us to pray, and he told us to lay our burdens at the feet of Jesus. And if you need prayer this morning, if there is something that is bothering you, something that, you know, is, is on your mind, you need to worry. Today we need prayer. We need to leave it at the feet of Jesus because there is a type of prayer that moves mountains. And uh, there's more to come, not today, but there's more to come as I, I interrogate that a little bit more. What did Jesus mean that if you pray, you can move a mountain? What is that type of prayer? What are the elements of that prayer that make such a big difference? I'll just say one thing as I close this one and make an appeal. Prayer is our weapon in the war room of the great controversy. Prayer is our weapon. Prayer is not a prayer is a privilege. Prayer is, you know, we don't pray because we don't understand the, 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 the role of prayer. I'll say two points. Number one, God is sovereign. Everybody agrees with that? Now, sovereign doesn't mean that he can do anything he wants to do. God can't lie. You see? God can't change his mind about himself. That, so sovereign just means he's a supreme ruler. However, however, what he did for man is he gave us free choice. He made man stewards of the earth. Do you remember that? He says, he says, he says um, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion on the earth. He says, I give you free choice. I give you freedom to, to like me or not like me. I give you freedom to obey me or disobey me. He took a risk, in other words. The Lord took a risk when he gave man the freedom of choice. And the message I want to send right now is this, that because God gave us freedom of choice, God has given us access to his throne room if we need it. That's what prayer is about. Prayer is accessing the throne room of God. The, Jesus says their father wants to give you much more than you are willing to ask. He says, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the mighty power that works in us through Christ Jesus. God wants to give us more than we can ask or think, but he says, you have the freedom and you have to ask me. I want to give it to you, but until you ask me, I can't help you. You see, prayer is our treasure chest in the war room of the great controversy. When we ask, God says, I can give you. I want to give you, but you have to ask me because you have a freedom of choice. You know, I, 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 I like the text. It's a hard text. But it's one that, that I think is worth reading. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. And it is really showing the power of prayer and the need for people who will pray. In Ezekiel 22, 30, it says, And I sought for a man among them that should, should, should stand, make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. Are you seeing the problem? He says, uh, he says, God says, I wanted to do something so I won't destroy them. And I needed somebody to come in agreement with me. Uh, are you following what I'm saying? Talk to me if you can. God says, I need somebody to come in agreement with me because you have ultimate stewardship on the earth. I just can't impose myself on you. 
I need you to come in agreement with me. He says, I look for a man that would, 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 would make up the hedge and stand in the gap so that I would not destroy the land, but I could find no one. Nobody to come in agreement with me. That's the power of prayer. God says, I need somebody to come in agreement with me. You remember when he went to, 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 to Abraham? He says, I'm going to destroy this city. He says, I just need somebody to come in agreement with me. When he went to, to, to destroy the land in the days of Noah, he went to Noah, a righteous man. He says, Noah, I want to destroy this place. I just need somebody to come in agreement with me because I can't do it on my own. You see, we mix up the sovereignty with God for his ability to do everything. Because he is sovereign, he gives us the free choice to come in agreement with him so he can heal our land. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, he says what? Then I will hear from heaven. You've got to come in agreement with him. If you want healing in your home, if you want healing in your, in your church, if you want healing in your families, Jesus says, come to me in agreement. Let me work in agreement with you. Because that's the only way I have, uh, the only access I have into the throne room of the great controversy. I'll stop with that because we, we, we've done enough, but it's the beginning of, of, of our prayer season, prison of prayer. What I hope at the end of it is that we will, we will see the, not only the importance of prayer, the necessity of prayer, and the power of prayer. Prayer is powerful. But you need to take hold of the strong arm of prayer and allow God to work in our families, in our lives, by coming in agreement with him for our own families, our own lives, our own churches. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you that we can come in agreement with you. You're a mighty God, a sovereign God who rules over the universe. But because of the freedom that you gave us, because of the dominion that you have given to us as a people, as uh, the, the mankind, you can't work on this earth unless we come in agreement with you. For whatsoever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so we thank you, O oh God, that we can work with you as co-laborers in this work. We know we're up against an enemy who has principalities and powers, territorial rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual hosts in, in high places. But Lord, we come against them in Jesus' name. With your mighty power, we ask for the angels that excel in strength, that do his bidding to come and work with us. And we give you the consent, the approval, and the agreement to work in our lives, in the lives of our church, the lives of this world, for your glory and your glory only. We thank you for a good word. Now bless us as we, at least in the beginning of this, this teaching, that we will absorb it and we will use it for your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you get a word, anybody? God bless you. Thank you, Brother Tony, for that um, sermon on prayer or discussion on prayer. Um, just before we sing our final hymn, talking about prayer, for those of you who don't know, our Sabbath school has a prayer session every Sabbath morning at 10 past nine. We try to finish just before half past so you can get to your classes and many have been coming please come along prayer is not just something that we do when we are in trouble it should be like Enoch every breath became a prayer to him um, just before we stand and sing our last hymn I want to say thanks to our orchestra we had some visiting friends with us Elizabeth and Daniela, is it? Right. So we are happy that you joined us today, enhanced our music. We, we usually have the full group and we are glad that you came to join us. Thanks to the gentlemen upstairs and those who are downstairs as well. Now let's stand and sing 538. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And we need guidance in this world that we are living in.
should come up here and hear yourself. Thanks to my assistants, the twins, Leola and Lakalani. I got it right here. Good. And to me. You know, the servant of the Lord Ellen White says, the angels are amazed why we don't pray more often because God is more willing to give than we are to receive. We are reluctant to pray. Let us go out here praying. Remember, God gives, it gives God access to your life. Amen? I want to make sure everybody got that. Prayer is not just talking words. Prayer gives God access to interfere in your life. He can't touch your home. He can't touch your church. He can't touch in your family. He cannot do anything unless you give him access to you. Prayer gives God access to interfere on planet Earth. Let us go out praying. Give him the more access he has, the more blessings he can give, and he's more willing to bless than we are to receive. Let us pray. Father, we give you access to our lives right now. We give you the permission to interfere with us, interfere with our homes, interfere in our churches, interfere in this country, interfere in the world. We give you access to allow angels that excel in strength, that do your bidding, to come and assist us as a people. And Lord, to beat back the forces of the enemy so that we can stand before you as perfect people. We thank you for a good word that helps us to understand this. Now help us to put it into practice, not to be afraid to pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Let us keep that talk, communication, access going so that you can interfere in our work in our lives for your glory. And we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in all of these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you. Yes, be seated, family. Just really quickly, who was blessed by that word this morning? Thank you, Dr. Tony. I think you could, we could, all of us could relate to that. And uh, uh, I've got a more important question who's going to spend more time in prayer today and this week? Yeah, amen, amen. Uh, we, have a, we have a time of prayer now. You can join us if you'd like. Joe is going to lead us in that. We also have lunch in the hall. I invite you down to uh, lunch, sandwiches, and fruits. You're more than welcome to join us for lunch. Thank you, family. God bless you. And also see uh, our brother David uh, for our books, uh, Step Beyond, and also hand sanitizer. Next Sabbath, we have our, our brother ATN who, who will speak. Next Sabbath, thank you, family. God bless you. Safe travel black uh, back home is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.